Hi everyone, and welcome to PMP Live. My name is Brittany Kerfoot. I am the Partnered Events Manager at Politics and Prose, and we just want to say thank you for joining us in this new format where we can still bring you the author events that we're known for, but now just in the comfort of your own living room. Um, a couple things before we start. You will see right down below, um, probably in the center of your screen, a green button, and that goes directly to our website so that you can purchase tonight's book. Um, indie bookstores, as I'm sure you can imagine, are struggling more than ever right now. Now. So we really need your book purchases um, in order to, to stay afloat and to kind of keep giving you these events. Um, fun fact, we are offering free shipping right now on all orders. So feel free to stock up um, on any books tonight. And um, also, you can ask the author a question tonight. Also on the bottom of your screen, there's a button that says ask a question. Um, so put your question for either author really there and you can vote on questions that you wanna see answered the most. So that can be really helpful to our moderator. Um, also, just so you know, we cannot see you. The only people who can see each other are the people that are on screen. So I hope all of you are in your comfy pants and maybe with a glass of wine. And so feel free to, um, to get comfortable. Nobody can see you. That's the beauty of, of online events. Uh, okay, now on to tonight's event. Rebecca Solnit is the author of more than 20 books and many essays on feminism, activism and social change, hope and the climate crisis. In Recollections of My Non-Existence, Solnit describes her formation as a writer and a feminist in 1980s San Francisco in an atmosphere of gender violence on the street and throughout society and the exclusion of women from cultural arenas. Solnit's conversation partner tonight is Soraya Shamali an award-winning writer, media critic, and author of Rage Becomes Her, The Power of Women's Anger. She writes and speaks regularly about gender, media, tech, education, women's rights, sexual violence, and free speech. So now it is my absolute pl pl pleasure to bring onto your screens Rebecca Solnit and Soraya Shamali. All right, there we go. Hello, everybody. Hello, Soraya. Hi. Hi. And yeah, can you hear me? Here in California, still for a few more hours. Hello, evening in DC. I'm gonna say thank you. <laughs> Here we go. Now I can see you. We'll work through the wrinkles. Um, hi. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and um, to Politics and Prose for hosting this event. Rebecca and I were originally meant to speak in person on March 13th, and um, for all of the reasons we know, we couldn't do that. Uh, but this is really uh, delightful to be able to do this. And we'd like to thank uh, all of you, too, for participating tonight and for supporting Politics and Prose um, in its efforts to move these things online so that we can all have conversations like this. Uh, we're going to start actually with Rebecca, who will read from the introduction of her book, from the beginning of her book, and then she and I will talk for a while and then move to your questions. Rebecca? Thank you so much. The book. One day long ago, I looked at myself as I faced a full length mirror and saw my image darken and soften, and then seemed to retreat, as though I was vanishing from the world, rather than that my mind was shutting it out. I steadied myself on the door frame just across the hall from the mirror, and then my legs crumpled under me. My own image drifted away from me into darkness, as though I was only a ghost fading even from my own sight. I blacked out occasionally and had dizzy spells often in those days, but this time was memorable because it appeared as though it wasn't that the world was vanishing from my consciousness, but that I was vanishing from the world. I was the person who was vanishing and the disembodied person watching her from a distance, both and neither. In those days, I was trying to disappear and to appear, trying to be safe and to be someone. And those agendas were often at odds with each other. And I was watching myself to see if I could read in the mirror what I could be and whether I was good enough. 
and whether all the things I've been told about myself were true. To be a young woman is to face your own annihilation in innumerable ways, or to flee it, or the knowledge of it, or all those things at once. The death of a beautiful woman is unquestionably the most poetical topic in the world, said Edgar Allan Poe, who must not have imagined it from the perspective of women who prefer to live. I was trying to not be the subject of someone else's poetry and not to get killed. I was trying to find a poetics of my own with no maps, no guides, not much to go on. They might, might have been out there, but I hadn't located them yet. The struggle to find a poetry in which your survival rather than your defeat is celebrated, perhaps to find your own voice to insist upon that, or at least to find a way to survive amidst an ethos that relishes your erasures and failures is work that many and perhaps most young women have to do. In those early years, I did not do it particularly well or clearly, but I did do it ferociously. Thank you so much for that, Rebecca. Um, what I'm always struck by in your writing, um, aside from the rawness and intensity of it, is how much it can evoke, uh, certainly of my personal experiences, um, you put into words so many feelings and um, the kind of knowledge that can come with admitting what this passage through life is like. I'm, I'm really struck and wanted to start off by asking you how you feel. You write a lot about your childhood and, your, and, and, and the impact and the evolution that it had on your life as a thinker and a writer. But really strike that for someone like me it can resonate but other people are horrified if you write about the dance we do with violence constantly I know that when I write about sexual violence or domestic violence or just the everyday risk assessments that we go through to make it from the beginning of the day to the end of the day um, it seems like an alien world to some people whereas it feels extremely familiar to others how would you categorize that difference in people's thinking when they, when, they, when they read what you write? Well, I think for a lot of people, it resonates because it's their experience. And it's certainly the experience of a lot of people of color, or of whatever gender, that to be out in the world is to be in danger. And, um, you know, so it's always an interesting thing. I realized writing this book, how often James Baldwin wrote for a white audience to explain what it means to be black to them. And I don't think I wrote this with only one audience in mind, but I do know that what we've all done in feminism often has been, you're not crazy, it really happens to all of us. It's huge, it's a problem. It's don't let them gaslight you. It's not your fault and it's not all in your head. So I think, you know, in a way it's affirming a reality that isn't personal and specific to me. And this book is really two narratives twisted around each other. One, a very particular and peculiar narrative of how I found my voice and became a writer, which, you know, and writing itself is a peculiar profession most of us don't do for a living or as a vocation. But it's also about a very generic experience that's inseparable from it, which is what my experience as a young woman was, which was experiencing constant physical threat, but also threats designed to keep me from having a voice, to prevent me from participating in the con conversation, to discredit me whenever I spoke up. There's anecdote after anecdote in this book where the, in a way the worst thing isn't that something terrible just happened to me, but that the people I tell it to don't believe it. And, you know, and that happens in professional and educational and personal spheres over and over. So I wanted to just write about that experience of being nobody and nothing, of not having a voice and what it does to you to not have a voice or rather not to be listened to because we all have a voice and to try and think about it as it was particular to my experience of gender, but also to understand how it affects gay men, how it affects black men, how it affects other kinds of people in other situations. And, you know, and because I learned so much 
from the Native Americans. I joined in a land rights movement that was a formative experience for me from the black neighborhood I lived in, from the gay neighborhood that was a short walk south of me and so many other people. And that was very rambly, but this may be the nature of internet conversations. Yes, that's right. Well, um, the thing that uh, occurs to me when you describe this quality of not being believed is uh, Miranda Fricker, a, a philosopher's uh, framing a, a, of the problem as epistemic injustice and particularly testimonial injustice, which is that quality of not being believed because of who you are, the gaslighting, the dismissal, the trivialization. And um, you have always argued ardently for the power of this storytelling to raise awareness, to make change. And um, you write a little bit about that. Can you talk about the passage of change? I am more cynical than you are, I think. I think you're ultimately a more hopeful person than I am. But you do talk about change in a way that allows us to step back and really think of what's happened over the course of 30 or 40 years even. Um, can you talk about what that means to you? Um, yeah. The change that, that we have and the hope that we could have. And you're, you keep blurring, um, your voice keeps blurring. If your family's using the internet, this is, a, I will answer that question and this is a great moment for you to text them to cut it out. <laughs> no, there, no one's on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you brought them doing that much. I've hard the, right. the use of the internet right. for our hour. And, um, yeah, I'm, I often think hope comes from the long-term trajectory and that, you know, I often have people saying nothing's changed and I'm like, yeah, nothing's changed from since yesterday and maybe nothing's changed for the better since last year, but let's look at a 50 or 100 year slice of time. And I was born into a world where gender inequality was codified even into marital laws governing that essentially gave husbands absolute control over their wife's body, reproduction, finances, work, and other aspects of her life. Essentially to get married was to enter into uh, an ownership owned relationship. And I was born into a world in which pretty much all the Ivy Leagues did not admit women, in which there had never been a Supreme Court justice, maybe one or two women senators, in which people weren't even asking the questions. And we had to even find our way to the questions. Those amazing women's groups of the 60s and 70s were just finding ways to say, why are things like this? Why are our roles so asymmetrical? Why am I not even supposed to imagine doing this? You know, and it happened even, I, I remember several years ago, women saying, why when two people are walking towards each other on a street, is it usually the woman who gives way? What are the spatial dynamics that govern our lives? And feminism has proceeded as a series of questions. I do think that we've experienced extraordinary change for the better. That doesn't mean that everything is beautiful and fixed and now it's all over. I think even the fact we ask questions why is that an all-male panel? Why is that an all-male cabinet deciding the fate of humanity? Uh, you know, means that we've launched something, we haven't finished it, we haven't fixed everything. And just the, you know, I feel a little bad about all those little girls being told you can be anything in the wake of what just happened to Elizabeth Warren, let alone what happened, you know, last time a woman ran for president and and all the other things. And those are white women with Ivy League educations. But I do think that this is a radically different world uh, than it was 50 or 60 years ago. And so that I actually find really encouraging. And even the questions we asked, even the language to point out systemic inequality on this epistemic injustice, uh, you know, is a new idea. And just finding the tools to analyze these things I think is really important. I hang out with doctors and nurses a lot and it's given me a lot of good metaphors. I say that a diagnosis is not a cure, but even to diagnose something is huge. And the project of feminism since the uh, feminine mystique that came out, I think the year I was born has been into 
start just by diagnosing things that were undiagnosed. And actually the feminine mystique talks about the problem that has no name. It has a lot of names now. So I don't, I don't think everything's automatically getting better. I'm not an optimist, but I think that things have changed profoundly in recent years. So recent decades, really. a, a lot of what you have written about right in this has to with the, the public violence and threats, but really has to do also with intimate violence and threats, with intimate sexism and the, the mechanism of that sexism within homes um, and its connection to these bigger social issues. I find this time um, of uncertainty and threat and fear um, has made people maybe more aware of what that looks like because everyone has to be assessing risk in new and different ways that ironically make me think, well, they aren't really new and different for everyone, you know, for people who, as you say, feel threat outside, for people who have to be hypervigilant, this level of vigilance is um, not easier, but certainly more familiar. Um, but even the idea that we can self-isolate safely in our homes is simply not one that's such a huge percentage of women and children uh, can can have in their lives. Um, can you talk about that too, and the way that you sort of weave that that idea of intimacy and violence through the book? Yeah, I just saw uh, a friend shared where somebody. Somebody said a man complained to me that he went outside for a walk, but it's not even relaxing anymore because he has to be constantly vigilant to make sure everybody's at a safe distance from him. And she said, like, welcome to what I've been doing my whole life. Right. So there's that. And I think this brings up something that feminists have been talking about for a while, which is we have constantly had a rhetoric that asserts that home is where you're safe. You know, and women have constantly been told, oh, the stranger on the street is the great menace to you. But the majority of violence that affects women is uh, intimate partner violence, family violence, and sexual assault is mostly committed by people you know. So it's actually the unknown is our safety and the known is our danger in many ways. And I, had a, I grew up in a violent household and escaped it at an early age and really had a sense of accomplishment, like thank God I got out of that and then found out because it hadn't really sunk in the level of sexual harassment and beyond sexual harassment of, of gendered menace that would face me constantly out in public as a young woman really hit me hard when I was 19, which is when this book begins, the sense that, okay, now I have my own apartment. And there's a whole story in the book about the wonderful man who, who welcomed me into the building. He managed a black World War II vet and gave me this safe space for the next 25 years in which nothing dangerous or violent ever happened to me. But I was in a world, suburban as well as urban, everywhere I went it felt like, of menace and threat. And also a world where no one wanted to acknowledge it as outrageous, a threat to my liberty, a violation of my rights. Everyone was just treating it like weather. Well, like, you know, the way we're like, well, you won't get wet if you have an umbrella and galoshes. Everyone was like, well, you just have to buy a gun and cut your hair off and dress like a man and learn martial arts and never leave the house alone and travel everywhere with a man and always take a taxi. And, and, <laughs> and just constantly treat it as, oh, it's absolutely inevitable that men want to torture you possibly unto death in hideous and degrading ways. And you never know what will happen. But like, it's not really a problem. It's just the weather, get used to it, it's fine. Right. Not it's just the way things are. And that was really part of, and I talked to, you know, I just said something earlier, that not being heard, and I felt like there was, and of course feminism was doing a very good job in this period in their late 80s of talking about it. Women like Susan Griffin, who's now a friend of mine, yeah, were writing about it eloquently, but I was young and far away from the movement and the voices. And really what made me a feminist was the fact that I couldn't walk down the street with confidence. And I am a born walker and wanderer. 
And that was essential to both the practical business of getting around and, uh, you know, and also to exploring and being free and being the wanderer that I have always been. And the fact that no one had anything meaningful to say about it made me, and here in the book, I stopped and said, I won't say it made me crazy because when women are full of unbearable anguish or truths nobody wants to listen to, we call them crazy. So it didn't make me crazy. It made me anguished and stressed out. And Did it make it, you angry? Furious. Are and you furious? There, because now you're just a little icon. But no, I, can't <laughs> I um, can you still hear me though? Oh yeah, no. Now you're loud and clear. Okay. Um, I was um, I was asking if it also made you furious. I couldn't hear the last part of your sentence. I, you know, I have an ambivalent. I grew up I know. with furious real people. <laughs> And it, it made me furiously indignant, I think, because there's a kind of anger that wants to commit harm that wasn't what I had. Mm -hmm. I had self-defense fantasies that were quite violent, but I didn't want to harm anybody. I was just profoundly outraged that this was the normal condition of women and everyone was finding it acceptable on my behalf when I wanted someone to just get on board with me and say, nobody should have to live like this. Everybody has the right to walk down the damn street. Mm -hmm. This is a human rights issue and a civil rights issue, and we should do something about it. And of course, feminists were trying to do something about it, but it felt like it really took until 2012, 2013 for us to have just the meaningful conversation in a big public mainstream media way that I was waiting for all those years earlier. And after the murder, rape torture of Jyoti Singh in New Delhi, the Steubenville rape case, mm -hmm. and some of the campus activism. Because I think something changed. The people who decided what the story was and who we were going to listen to and care about and believe and value, we finally started having that conversation. And I think some of the really boring feminism that decided who would you know, that changed who the judges were and the television producers and the assignment editors at newspapers, who the provosts and deans were at universities. And, you know, it changed who decided what the story was. So we finally have been having this conversation. And if this book is, despite all the grim gore, kind of cheerful, it's not because I found an individual voice, but because I found a conversation to join about these things. And that really has been how it felt the last seven or so years. So, and of course you've been a beautiful and powerful part of that, that conversation, but I still can't. Oh, well, you. thank you. I was going to say, I, I was going to say, it's really, I, I also believe in the power of feminist storytelling. Um, it, it accrues and accrues and accrues. It's, I think something that happens quite slowly over time. And then there's an inflection point. And I think 2012, 2013 was clearly an inflection point for the kind of storytelling. And as you say, for the slight loosening of the reins of um, gatekeepers, I think something important happened in terms of gatekeepers. And what we've seen as a result, I think has been quite remarkable and uh, just a small part of what it still can be because yeah. even though changes happen, marginalized voices are still marginalized and often the people saying the hard truths are the most subject to online violence and vitriol and harassment. Um, but I did think a lot while I was reading your book about Susan Griffin's poem, Wear a Dress, uh, which I recite all the time where she says, um, if I think she, she's talking about how to help women and she goes wear a dress and walk down Telegraph Street and then she goes on from there to describe what it's like to be a woman in a dress in constraining undergarments um, and to have that persistent gaze and I think we saw the essence of that poem in so much activism um, anti-street harassment activism for example um, and um, online uh, confrontations and you talk about some of that I think you talk about voice and voice having to have credibility and authority so 
Yes, we all have a voice, but what to you to be able to increasingly speak with credibility and authority? Yeah, one thing I realized is that we always talk about does, you know, woman gained a voice, she has a voice, they, you know, and it's like everybody has a voice. Do they have people willing to listen and believe them? And it was, you know, one of the things I like about writing books is it makes me think harder than I might just sort of wandering around and musing. And really, I really kind of pushed through this question for myself and realized that people were always speaking about these things. And we've heard with some of the famous cases, like, well, why didn't she speak up earlier? And of course, the answer to that is clear when women were threatened, punished, humiliated, disbelieved, et cetera, for speaking up. You know, and so there was there were a lot of reasons for women to not speak up, but often they did, but people were not interested, the arenas, they were not invited into the arenas in which their voice would matter. The legal system did not engage with the stories they had to tell. Uh, they were not believed, they were mocked and humiliated, and there was this whole business. And so I broke down what it, what having a voice means into audibility, credibility, and consequence. Audibility mm -hmm. means that you can participate in the arenas where, that matter, that you get your day in court, that you become part of the conversation in other arenas, et cetera, that you can literally be heard, which is not just about your ability to make noises, but to be in places where, mm -hmm. just where it matters and then Credibility is whether people believe you. And I, when I wrote my essay, Men Explain Things, in 2008, I said credibility is a basic survival tool. And I told a story about a woman running down the street naked in the middle of the night in Livermore, California, where they make the nuclear bombs. And the nuclear physicist who told me that story laughing because he assumed the only logical explanation for a woman running down the street in the middle of the night claiming her husband was trying to kill her was that she was crazy. And I said, well, how do you know her husband wasn't trying to kill her? And his assumption that middle-class white people include a lot of crazy ladies, but no homicidal men was just so entrenched. And so credibility is that people are, you know, it doesn't mean women never lie and that no story ever needs to be verified. I think believing people enough to check out their story give them the benefit of the doubt everybody's story mm -hmm. is the, you know is what it means to have credibility that you're not automatically categorically discounted and um and then consequence means you tell your story and it matters it has consequences and we saw christine blazy ford who came forward and she had audibility for a huge number of us she had credibility but she didn't have con consequence because she told a harrowing story that corresponded to other harrowing stories other women told about Brett Kavanaugh. He did many things that were clearly lies essentially on the stand, had a tantrum and a self pity and a goofy rage that in turn red in the face, exhibited stuff that you wouldn't really want to see in a 13 year old and got appointed to the Supreme Court. And there was a sense no matter what she did, she didn't have consequence and no matter what he did, he couldn't lose consequence. So I, those are some of the pieces it takes to have a voice, audibility, credibility, and consequence. And I think, you know, I've had a very peculiar trajectory as an independent writer, but I've had a very ordinary trajectory as a woman, even as a white woman and an educated woman, trying to have audibility, credibility, and consequence. And as a young woman, because I think things change a lot as you age in terms of the level of harassment and the you know the way men won't listen to you because they're too busy sexualizing you to notice that you know words are coming out of your mouth and all the rest and um, <laughs> i feel like i'm taught i was telling something that was a you know significant not because i had an exceptional experience which is often supposed to be the basis of memoir but because it was so completely ordinary and i also wanted to write about what the experience of violence is like not when, as in many really great books, you're the recipient of some spectacular and exceptional incidents of violence, but just when violence is such an omnipresent force in your life, in my case from before birth, impacting my mother and at least one of my grandmothers, 
to, you know, it never stops. I think I read about violence against women every day, whether or not I'm looking for it. Right. And because it is omnipresent and we work so hard as a culture to not talk about it as a pandemic worse than any other yeah. pandemic in some ways and more, more global. And the fact that the pandemic we're living through is so inflected by the gender violence that makes sheltering in place Yes. Unsafe for a lot of women is at least something we're discussing, but such a horrific thing to contemplate. It really is. Um, the, it's inflected with the violence, but it's also so infused by the, the topic of gender and gender norms and uh, the kind of work that we're expected to do as men or as women and the kinds of behavior that we're taught to engage in. And um, it makes me think a lot about this issue that more men are dying from this disease. And there are many, many complicated reasons for that. But doctors are fairly certain that among the reasons are the performance of masculinity, the not washing of the hands, smoking more, engaging risky people and talk about those things you know we we kind of homogenize all of it and um, it, I, it, it's kind of a shadow world to the very clear impacts uh, and racial differences that this disease has because of systemic systemic racism um, in community after community after community and when I was reading your I, I reread a chapter yesterday and um, I happened to also see a, a lot of people talking about this issue of wearing masks and bandanas and the assumption that everyone can just do that. Whereas for um, black men in particular, that is a dangerous proposition very often. And um, and and so we, we make all of these assumptions about identity and the passage that we, that we make through the world. Um, I, I want to go back though to this idea of voice and violence, because uh, I'll say to um, tell the story of your desk, which to me is a really central thread throughout the whole book. I'm kind of tempted to move the computer to show everyone the actual desk here. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> and I should just say for the record, I've been reading fairy tales to kids online on Facebook Live. And um, so I've been building a little stage set um, for them. And this is a version of the stuff I've been doing for the kids. So if you're wondering why I have both the green woman and a Buddha, <laughs> um, as, the audi as, as my live studio audience here. But um, yeah, you know, and my desk really gets at how impacted I think we are, even by the things that don't happen to us, but happen to the people around us. Because also we talk about violence as a kind of on off binary, either it happens to you or it doesn't happen to you. But I like to go back to black men and their fears. You know, there's a lot of categories of people who have to live in fear because the level of violence against them is so predictable and chronic. But my desk, so I've had the same desk, which is probably just a lady's vanity. It was given to me by a friend when I was 19, right after I moved into that apartment where the book was. And just before she gave it to me, the man she had left because he was a terrible boyfriend stabbed her 15 times for daring to leave him. And that's so normal in, uh, in gender violence and domestic violence. It's essentially says, I need to be in control of you forever. Killing you is a way to be in control of you. How dare you leave me because then you're putting your own priorities over how dare you value yourself. I will devalue you. But she almost led to death. Somebody came by and she was rushed to the hospital and got the transfusions. And as a very young woman, I was familiar with her scars without emotion because I think I just was just so numbed to violence and had no way to think about it. And again, it was only writing this book, I thought, my God, everything I have ever written 
my parents' obituaries, love letters, student papers, grading my students' papers with letters to them, talks, essays, polemics, the essay men explain things. Everything has been written on a platform given to me by a woman who a man tried to silence forever. And it really came to seem like quite a resonant and really kind of disturbing thing that all my all my writing life I've been writing on a gift from a woman who was supposed to be silenced forever and who barely avoided that terrible fate that does happen so often to so many women and happens in so many less than fatal ways that women lose their voices. So the death scene came to seem like a really symbolically resonant thing. And there it is. And it's quite tiny. It really is a lady's vanity. I had uh, somebody cut a couple little knobs off it so I could actually just fit my thighs under it without getting gouged <laughs> many years ago. And I know whether we're supposed to have big impressive deaths, but it's been 39 years. Um, maybe I'm sticking with it. <laughs> Well, thank you for that. Um, I think that uh, it's probably a good time to start taking questions. And let's see, we have uh, just just about 20 minutes left. And um, I think we're, we're eager to get questions from the audience, uh, which I will read as soon as they appear here. Let's see, I'm gonna... Um, all right, I have a question. Um, Toward the end of her life, Grace Lee Boggs often spoke about conversation as a form of activism. What are some conversations with other women that have most shaped your own activism? Oh, wow. I My second book is really about the my most, you know, this book in a different way recounts some of the experiences I had in the early 90s. Um, I joined a Native American land rights movement and the Western Shoshone sisters, Carrie and Mary Dan, who were leading it, felt like the most free and fearless woman I ever met, maybe the only real matriarchs I feel like I've ever met. And there's no one thing, and it's not usually like a woman's, you know, like, oh, somebody said this amazing thing, which I will now share with you. It usually kind of feels like exam like by example, and around the same time, my cousin, Mary Solnit Clark, my father's first cousin, the first Solnit born in this country from our refugee family, who was a co-founder of Women's Strike for Peace, which was a radical feminist anti-war movement in which 100,000 women went on strike in November 1961 against nuclear war and war. She was a, a great leader in that. And she, again, was a woman who just had a kind of confidence and power and fearlessness that just felt so rare. The fact that I was, I didn't know she existed because we're the black sheep solnits and she was part of the white sheep solnits. <laughs> so when I met her in 1990, um, just to see a woman in my family who felt so undamaged and literally unbattered and un, you know unbowed was really amazing. And then the rest of them, I think, are people in books. And I could go to writers like Susan Sontag and um, God, and this is always where my mind goes blank about who I should mention. But uh, Susan oh, well, Griffin actually has been we have force Hannah Arendt. And, um, you know, Hannah Arendt has filtered through a couple of wonderful men in my life. Jonathan Shell and my friend Alan Martinez were both great scholars of her work. At um, so, and um, now I'm looking at my books, which are kind of floating over here. But Sabrinante Marcos and George Orwell will not help me, although I do see Adrian Marie Brown on this stack. <laughs> but you know, I just won't go blank with questions like that. So, like an hour later, I will have a wonderful list, and I'll share. Well, let's loop them. back. Right, we can we can do that. I'm going to go to yeah. another question. Um, across your career, you've written about such a wide range of topics, from Weaveridge's photography to Freudian's exploration of, of course, violence against women. What inspires you to about a particular topic? And I hear, I know that last year, I believe you won 
um, an award for your writing about uh, the environment and environmental movements. Um, so it really is very wide ranging um, in possibly yeah. the span of. I don't believe all human beings are complicated and most of us are interested in a lot of things. I had a really funny experience many years ago at a, a faculty party. I've been to about three of them, they all of which were scary. And at this one, someone cor cornered me and said, and what, what is your field of expertise? And I was just completely stumped because I do not have a PhD in anything and et cetera. And I thought for a second, I said, I'm a professional amateur. My training in journalism was training in how to find stuff out and be reasonably competent to talk about things. And it feels like the best work in the world, this being a writer, where whatever you find most deeply interesting, but also that feels like might be important to other people, you're free to go out and investigate. And I've tried to understand what does it mean to be a Westerner in a culture that's often so centered on the history and culture and racial dynamics of the East Coast that I often feel a bit like a colonial subject in a far from flung place where, you know, we don't even have four seasons. We were not part of the, not much part of the Civil War. We were part of Spain during the, Mex the Revolutionary War. We share a border with Mexico and face Asia, you know, but also, you know, and, and books led to other books. My History of Walking, which did include a lot about the gender politics of being out in public, raised questions for me about wandering and getting lost that led to my book, A Field Guide to Getting Lost, which was also kind of a breakthrough in writing a more personal, lyrical, um, intuitively directed prose. But it also led to the Moybridge book, which was about the disembodiment an acceleration of experience with 19th century technologies and a kind of prehistory for Hollywood and Silicon Valley. You know, I persistently interested in landscape and nature and place and the environment, which for the last couple of decades has meant being really concerned about climate change. Something I also address as a board member of Oil Change International, a great climate group, and a supporter of other groups. You know, I've been interested in gender politics all through my writing career as well. And um, nobody ever seems to have added it up. I've, you know, I've been interested in, in race and racial injustice, writing about genocide against Native American people and representational genocide, writing about the racial dynamics of Hurricane Katrina. So, you know, and a lot of it is just what's around me. I live, I live in a, a city and a nation full of many kinds of people. What does their experience tell us? But I think something that, you know, I live in a country and a state with an imperiled environment. What do the wildfires tell us? What? But I also think that the question that drives me a lot is what story isn't being told? And I mentioned that as a Californian, there's certain stories that aren't being told. As a woman, there's certain stories that aren't being told. And then as a white lady, it's often like, okay, but actually there are other people's stories that aren't being told. And just trying to understand what and why, why how were Native Americans written out of environmental history and what did that do to the white imagination, to mismanagement of the environment and to the other forms of genocide against Native Americans was a huge question at the center of my second book as you know, another way of thinking about the Indian Wars, what stories are missing from the conversation? And sometimes as a writer, you just become a conduit to bring forth stories that have been left out that might be old, might be new ways of talking about the same things, might be people have left out, been left out historically, might be the kind of journalistic writing where you're just trying to get out of the way to foreground somebody else's story. So, you know, so, so that's um, scattershot answer, but that's some of it. Well, actually, this it's interesting. There's um, the the questions here have have um, the audience is able to vote for them, and um, <laughs> the wow. the the top ranked question right now, which I think is really related to what you just described, the missing voices. Um, is why do you think women are so reluctant to admit they're angry? 
And, um, you know, we, we touched on this earlier, but I think of anger as a way to address this imbalance, this epistemology. Take the idea that Audre Lorde talked about and wrote about so much that it's that the in the anger there's knowledge. Um, but even just now when we spoke, you you were saying that you were outraged um, and that you had a, a a a kind of furiousness. But why do you think so many women are reluctant to admit their anger? Because in this anger, there's so much truth and storytelling. And I think we, I think the word anger covers galaxies of different experiences. It can be a physical upwelling of adrenaline and, you know, people turning red in the face and stuff like that. It can be a long simmering indignation on the behalf of other people. It can be, you know, it can be a, a, a flash when someone cuts you off in traffic or it can drive somebody for decades. You know, I think there, but I also think that there's a real difference between sort of physiological anger response, moral indignation, and, um, you know, and it's, and so much more. But I also, I think you touch on something really important that being angry is not ladylike. Women are discredited for being angry. Right. There was a really interesting conversation happening a few months ago about how Elizabeth Warren was not afraid to be essentially angry and to be angry on the behalf of the vulnerable, to be angry on behalf of justice. So I, th I want to see a world in which everyone has an equal right to be angry in the sense, in that sense that like a John Lewis or Elizabeth Warren is. At the same time, I've lived my whole life around terrifyingly angry men, you know, first growing up and then seeing them yelling at people on the street, mm -hmm. yelling at us, from the White House, et cetera. And I, anger is physiologically bad for you. It's often, we often talk about it as though it's people who are out of control, but it's often used as a way to control other people, et cetera. So I right. think, I, you know, I think if we could develop a vocabulary to make all these distinctions, rather than having one word that talks about you know, it's as though we talked about animals and we're talking about, you know, goldfish and elephants and whales and pythons with the same word. Those are all animals, right. but. Well, and I think you know, too, what you. So I think, yeah, there's a politics of anger where everyone should have equal access to anger and everyone should have, you know, and then there's a separate thing. What are we angry about? Women are often angry because they're thwarted they're thwarted because of misogyny and intersectional versions of misogynoir and, you know, and other things. So how do we address the root causes of that anger? Well, that's so different than what a lot of male anger is, which is an assumption, I should be in control. I should be in control of you. I have the right to punish you. Now I'm going to punish you, which is, you know, my friend being almost stabbed to death, right. et cetera. So. Right. Well, I think, I think so much of the anger that you describe that's linked to threat and control and violence is ultimately really a mismanagement too. It's a mismanagement of the emotions yeah. that, that, because we don't learn to be emotionally competent. Um, but we have two more questions before we close. And um, one, one I'll go straight from the anger to the stress that anger brings and the unhealthy outcomes that it can bring to a great question from um, a friend and fellow feminist of ours, Jacqueline Friedman. Um, she's, she says that post 9-11, we saw a retrenchment of regressive slash oppressive gender roles. It seems like a similar dynamic is already happening as we all crowd into the domestic sphere during this current crisis. Are there actions we can take now individually and collectively to avert long gender bash once the crisis starts to ease. And I think we see this cyclically after disasters like epidemics or natural disasters, that there's a real retrenchment. Um, do you think there are things that people can or should be doing to think about that and maybe change it? I'm absolutely, and I suspect there's going to be, when this is over insofar as disasters are ever over, there's gonna be a lot of couples dividing the unequal division of labor at home, straight couples. 
And I think now that much more is happening in the home, women who've already borne the burden of more childcare, more housework, more responsibility are getting a big dose. And women who are, su are supposed to do their jobs full time from home for white collar workers who still have jobs. Um, you know, that's what uh, Arleigh Hochschild called the second shift. Which is uh, now a third shift and a fourth shift. Yeah, happening even more intensely. You know, we also have this weird thing happening where suddenly we're all Betty, um, Betsy Ross sewing, except we're sewing masks, yes, not masks. flags. Innumerable women, and I, I literally have not seen a single mask. Like, I'm sure a man out there is sewing a mask, and sir, I salute you. And, um, but like so many women I know, Stephanie Sajuko, the great artist, and so many others have entered into mask, mass production. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I made, I actually made 10 masks. I have to finish tonight. Last night, I'm going to share with some family members. And um, I actually, and, um, but the, the gender divide of who's doing that and how unpaid female labor is, as it is in so many parts of everyday life, making up for systemic failures, right? you know, cleaning up after the mess is just, you know, is, is kind of disturbing and um, just so, the asymmetry there. Um, and then also, yeah, so at, um, you know, and I don't know what, you know, and I don't know what, I'm trying to think of what some of the other gender inequalities are, and I don't know, I can't see, I haven't figured out how to look at Jacqueline's question, what am I missing in it? Right, I think, I, I mean, I, I think they're all of these, I think that there's the microcosm of the family where there's this gender role, yeah. because women tend to feel responsibility for health and bodies and well-being and food and safety and risk. And, you know, that that's just magnified in this environment. Um, but also just the fact that this labor that women do, that, that women are doing puts them structurally in the most vulnerable positions. They're the majority of people who've lost jobs, the majority of people on the front lines of healthcare work. And all of those people, those women that have lost jobs and are doing that healthcare work, then also go back and have these dignified um, responsibilities at home. Um, I also don't know, I actually just wrote an article about this, but I don't really know how to answer Jacqueline's question because it is the question. Um, I said that we had one more question after this, but I'm gonna allow, I'm gonna use two because there's a, a good question here that's related. Um, in Cinderella Liberator, which you read last week, Cinderella asks her fairy godmother, why didn't you tell me I was free to go earlier? And the fairy godmother replies, I was really busy helping some other children. Also, I'm here to help people, but they have to ask for help. You never asked for help until the night of the ball. And then you, as a narrator, say, it's true that if you want or need help, it is really helpful to ask for it. I find that when I look at my mother, my aunts, my grandmother, all the women that I looked at to know how to be a woman, none of them ever asked for help. And this question concludes with, oh, it's from um, Susan Bryson. Um, how did you learn to ask for help? I, I did not ask for help much as a young person. I still don't ask that much. I do ask my friends to listen to me when I fetch. I don't either. But and to ask for help is to assume somebody's interested in your well-being and that the the vulnerability of exposing an unmet need is worth taking. And I don't think those are the circumstances everyone lives under. I heard some remarkable advice from a school teacher a few years ago, or maybe it was a college professor, but they said, the first row will be people who are confident that you're there to help them and confident about asking for help look for the people past them in the back who've never even thought of asking for help because they ne it never occurred to them anybody wanted to help them. And I do think that's, you know, the fairy godmother is doing what she does and you do have to sort of answer in Cinderella, how come she had to live in Durance Vile for so long? You know, I actually had this gay English teacher, Mr. Leslie in seventh and eighth grade and that is actually his words. If you if you want help, uh, asking for it is a really useful thing to do. But 
I do think we have to look at the people who don't expect to be helped and therefore or who are afraid to ask for help and you know and learn to read the cues there's been some extraordinary stories recently about really smart 911 operators interpreting conversations somebody pretended to be ordering a pizza because their abuser was in the house and they couldn't be talking literally and some brilliant 911 9, not 911 9, 911 mm -hmm. operator was able to continue ask questions that could be answered as if ordering a pizza, oh, right. 7 p.m., oh, here's our address, right. no pepperoni, uh, whatever. So it's, I do think all of us have a responsibility to look beyond. And in the teaching I've done myself, I've seen these kids who just almost think you're their nanny and here to, you know, tie their shoes and plan their vacations. Um, not many of my students, but, you know, and then these really wonderful people often who are not in the habit of asking for help because they haven't had a lot of it. So there's even kind of uh, an inequality of expectation of help that comes out of the unequal experience. And so I think it's helper's job to look really hard at that. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because it feels like this intersects with something we probably don't have time to answer, which is machismo on how oh, yes. that is for men, men not asking for help, for emotional help, not admitting um, to vulnerability, suffering, and all those other failures to connect that put them at risk in um, various ways, including in this pandemic. Mm -hmm. So but, we, we're going to have to wrap up. We have one last question before politics and prose comes back to, to end mm -hmm. the mission. Um, if anything, are you currently reading? Would love a oh recommendation. I'm reading uh, you know, a lot of smart people's Twitter feed and a lot of scientists about <laughs> coronavirus. I'm doing a lot of beautiful deep research for my next book, which I resumed since I'm not actually on book tour now, which has a lot to do with uh, mm -hmm. body and horticulture and authoritarianism and totalitarianism. Those things come together in a very exciting way in this book. And, um, you know, and I'm reading a lot of fairy tales because they are about marginal, devalued, poor, young uh, people and how they get through. It started to feel like a really good framework for talking to kids about where we are in this fairy, or, fairy tale ordeal of suddenly having to stay home. So I've been read, I've been running around trying to figure out what story I'm going to do. I did them five nights a week for two weeks and that was overwhelming. So I'm doing them two nights. But so, yeah, and I just got a load of books from my own, from one of my independent bookstores, Point Reyes Books, and um, including Jane Hirschfield's new book of poetry, Ledger, I'm excited to dive into. And um, so, yeah, so as usual, I am an omnivore with books, as, and I want to encourage everyone to in this time at, um, of withdrawal, order lots of books from your independent bookstores, Politics and Prose. Apparently it has free shipping. Almost any bookstore in this country can get almost any book in print for you. You do not ever actually need to go to Amazon and uh, certainly not for books. And um, thank you so much for supporting Politics and Prose and feminism and me and my book and independent bookstores and the thoughtfulness that I think is the real thing independent bookstores are here to cultivate and produce as a counter to the glibness and, and amnesia and other problems of the discourse. So thank you, Soraya. Thank you, Politics and Prose. Thank you, 187 people logged on. Uh, yes. Thank you, Susan. Uh, thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you, Feminism. Thank you. And thank you for your words and your wisdom. And I'm going to hand this back to uh, Brittany and say uh, thank you to Politics and Prose for bringing us all together. Thank both of you. Um, what a what an event. We need this right now. We need these words. Um, and thank you guys so much for both um, supporting independent bookstores. It's, it's so important right now. Um, and on that note, Remember, you can order Rebecca's book um, using the link below. We also have Soraya's book if you would like to get two uh, feminist pairs. I think that would be a great, <laughs> a great month of reading. Um, 
Ladies, thank you so much for being here. Thank all of you for supporting us. Um, please go check out politics-pros.com. We have lots of other events coming up. We have one with um, the ACLU DC on Thursday, um, which is another really important conversation to be having. So check that out and just thank everyone for being here. Stay well read. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good night. Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.